Matthew recorded selected events from the life and ministry of Jesus Christ in order to confirm to a Jewish audience that Jesus was indeed the Messianic King and to explain the kingdom program of God for the present age in light of and in spite of Israel's rejection of her king. The beginnings of Jesus' early life and ministry found in chapters 1 to 4 of Matthew are recorded to authenticate Jesus Christ as the prophesied King of Israel. Throughout Matthew's Gospel, there are 11 passages that are all introduced with a fulfillment formula that begins something like this, that it might be fulfilled. What Matthew is doing is linking the life and ministry of Jesus Christ with those prophecies that Old Testament saints predicted would take place in the fulfillment of God's plan. There are three sections to these paragraphs in Matthew chapter 1 through 4. First, the birth and surrounding events are written to demonstrate that Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. Matthew does this in four ways. First, the genealogy. He traces Jesus as both the son of David, Israel's great king, and the son of Abraham, the one to whom the covenant was originally given. And therefore, Jesus has the right to be the king of Israel. Through a series of names that Matthew records in this genealogy, he brings us through the history of the Old Testament from the time of Abraham to the time of the kingdom under David, from David to the captivity, and from the captivity to Christ. And so in chapter 1, linked with chapter 17, or chapter 1, uh, verse 1, and chapter 1, verse 17, we have this summation of the whole history of Israel revolving around the, the fact that Jesus Christ, as the son of David and the son of Abraham, has the right to the throne. Second, his birth. In his birth, he is demonstrated to be the virgin-born son of God, in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. His names will be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And his name is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Colossians tells us that in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in Christ, all of the fullness of deity, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in bodily form. He is truly Emmanuel. Even in his worship, when he gets gifts from the wise men, as Matthew records in chapter 2, they bring him gifts worthy of a king, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But even his escape to Egypt, when Herod threatens to take all the lives of the newborn babes in Bethlehem, even his escape argues for his kingship. For why would Herod be threatened by a little baby in Bethlehem if he was not a little bit nervous that the ones that the wise men announced as the king of the Jews could threaten even his kingdom. Secondly, in this section of Matthew's Gospel, the ministry of John the Baptist is recorded to signify that Messiah was present and that repentance was necessary for entrance into the kingdom of God. We learn two things about John. We learn something about him as a man and we learn something about him in his message. As a man, the Bible tells us that he was a priest. He was born to Zacharias and to Elizabeth, as Luke chapter 1 will detail. And he has the right then to represent God to humanity as he announces the coming of Messiah. He's also a prophet. Luke 1, 17 will tell us that he comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. He comes to call the people to repentance. He's also the one who has the office of being the herald, the forerunner who announces the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent. That's him as a man. In his message, he preaches repentance, he preaches judgment, and he preaches the coming Messiah. To avoid judgment and to be prepared for the Messiah, a change of mind, a change of heart, there needs to be a belief in this one called Jesus, Emmanuel, the King of Israel. Thirdly, in chapter 13 to chapter 4, we have a third argument for the kingship of Christ through his baptisms, his temptations, and his ministry. In his baptism, the Father and the Spirit authenticate him and inaugurate his ministry as the beloved Son of God, 
in whom God is well pleased. He's given the stamp of approval by God as the king of Israel. In his temptations, he shows that he has the power to defeat the enemy. He can overcome, whereas the first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. And those temptations of the lust of the flesh, the pride of life and the lust of the eyes, as Matthew records, Jesus shows his moral authority. And finally, through his ministry of preaching and teaching, echoing the very message of John the Baptist, he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then demonstrates that he has the power by the miracles that he performs meeting the needs of the multitudes.